This is The Bandwagon, a podcast about baseball and two mediocre teams showing off in a fall classic that probably people will not consider a classic eventually. I'm Hannah Geiser, I'm a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports, <laughs> joined us by Zach Kreiser, also a baseball writer at Yahoo Sports. The, the postseason has gotten better. We should say, sorry, that was a very negative note to start on, considering last time we ended on the note of saying it was a bad postseason. And since then, the postseason itself has gotten a lot better. But I do think this is going to be a weird World Series. I think weird is different than bad. Uh, That's fair. And, you That's know, fair. I'm sorry to the Diamondbacks primarily. We have <laughs> we have gotten two game sevens out of the CSs after uh, very much looking like we might not make it to game five in either of them, and now we have like a uh, you know a team that was definitely going for this and probably and spent as if this were the expectation. And uh, then we have the Diamondbacks who I think even their leadership probably thought the 2025 world series was a little more yeah. realistic than the 2023 world series, but they're here. I will say, okay, I'm going to steal a thought that producer John had just before the podcast where he was saying like, he was actually saying that you had this thought. Gotta be honest. Don't remember you having this thought, but maybe you did that. Sometimes the World Series do not reflect the story of the season, and this feels like one of those years. So that's what producer John said. And I was like, I actually don't know that that's true in as clear a way as, say, like 2021 to me feels like the peak example of that because, well, for two sort of not related reasons, but one, the 2021 season was about the Giants. Like that was about the San Francisco Giants, like continually defying expectations wire to wire and winning 107 games. And the World Series was won by the Braves, who didn't have Ronald Acuna Jr. with them because their season was actually about losing their best player and then having to like piece it together with like kind of random trade acquisitions. And so that to me feels like the classic example of like, if the World Series or the postseason had played out differently, we'd have a much more kind of like consistent, holistic, narratively satisfying view of the season. I don't necessarily know that this season is that i don't know that it's like you know a perfect consistent narrative but i just sort of think that the story of this season was two things i think one new rules and the diamondbacks are in some ways a really good example of that and two the mets and padres and the yankees all being bad and the rangers are sort of an interesting counter example to that so i actually for all that i got off on a negative foot about this world series i don't know that this world series is sort of so unrelated to the regular season, even though it features two teams who got in as wild cards and not any super team. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think the Diamondbacks are also an example of another storyline that was kind of related to both of those, which was a lot of young teams that maybe we thought were a year or two away were very much here. You know, the, the Orioles, totally. the Reds, and obviously the Diamondbacks were all in competition and making things happen in a way that we didn't necessarily see happening this soon. I, I want to talk about the, the narrative thing for a second, though, because 2021 is a great example of the way that people treat the past as the only thing that can be part of the narrative, and mm. they don't really consider how it works with the wow. future, because this is what I wrote about with the Diamondbacks today. The Giants won 107 games and have not been good since. Sure. And the Braves were the World Series champions. And if you were watching them right at that second, maybe you were making the same complaints that people are making about the Diamondbacks and to a lesser extent, the Rangers like, ah, this team shouldn't have even made the playoffs. Like, why are they in the World Series? And you know who's been amazing since that moment on? And it feels totally normal that they won the World Series. The Braves. So the postseason is part of the narrative and the future is part of the narrative. And all the Diamondbacks players are 23. Like, this team could be in October every year for the next five years, and this won't feel weird at all. But we're all, you know, some certain MLB network personalities are threatening to quit their jobs. Wish they would if, for the Diamondbacks winning this game. But, uh, you know, that's... It just feels like a... Wow, that was really uh, deep. I, I like what I, that was honestly, seriously, like, I think it's really interesting to think about that, that like, we want the postseason. I think you're right. That, like, we want the we want the World Series in particular to be a narrative conclusion to a a book that only consists of that particular year. But just since work. teams are continuously evolving and mutating 
characters that you're right. Like it's, it, I mean, let's be honest. It is a little bit less satisfying if it is instead related to a thing that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> oh, I agree. I'm not saying it's going to be satisfying this week, but right. it, when people say like, oh, the regular season doesn't mean anything and, you know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with this. It might have something to do with next regular season. You know, it, yeah. it, it is going to very possibly look more logical, look less weird the further you get from it, which is sort of what people want. They, they want the thing that they have internalized to be true. Mm-hmm. And they're just only willing to, you know, it's only possible to do it from one side. But I, I think, you know, if the Giants won the 2021 World Series, that would look really weird now. Yeah, it would have looked. It, I, I see. I think that's true. But I also think that that would have been the correct way to think of that season, even if everything else had stayed the same since, because it would give us a more in some ways, I actually think that would give us a greater sense of appreciation. I don't know why this is now a podcast about the 2021 Giants. I think we don't <laughs> talk about them enough. It would give us a greater sense of appreciation for how weird that was, I actually think. Like, I think if they had won that World Series and then just been like, whatever mediocre sins, which they have been, we would have more cause to be like, what happened that year? Which we should do because it's equally weird that they won 107 games as it would have been if they won the World Series. But I think because they didn't win the World Series, we don't pay as much attention to like, what happened that year when they won 107 games? I do think I'll just, we'll do one more like weird big picture thing that we'll actually get into it. Is there a team to, to continue with this sort of conceit? Is there a team that could have or should have, or two teams that could have or should have met in the World Series that would have felt like, ah, yes, that is the 2022, 20, what year is it? 2023? Three. 2023. Whoa. The 2023 regular season encapsulated in the postseason. Like who should have? Because yeah. I was thinking the, about it and I, I don't know that that's true. The Braves and Orioles. Yeah, it's the, the Braves. Braves and Orioles. You're right. The Braves should have been there. Yes. The Orioles, to me, feel more like a. I don't know. They didn't look good in the postseason, man. They just didn't. I mean, like that's, the Braves didn't. But that's the whole thing. That, I know. That's what, I know. You know, if you want but, to talk about what yeah. mattered from the seed, I know those are the two number one seeds, but right. like that's how. That's, but the, the, the know, Orioles are more of a beginning. I think the Braves, I think you're right. The Braves should have won this World Series so that way we could have been like, wow, it was really the Braves from 2021 plus. Ronald Acuna Jr. being even better, like the star of this. I wrote this actually at some point. I wrote about how he was like the star <laughs> of the season, and I don't remember when. I think when they got eliminated. All right. Instead of that, we have the the Rangers and the D backs. Um, I was cat sad that we were denied a Ranger on Ranger crime if the Phillies had made it, <laughs> and we would have had Ranger Suarez facing the Rangers. <laughs> that would have been a delight. There were there are so many things. That like when you're down to four teams, you're thinking about the connections. You're like, wow, when it's the Astros and the D-backs, we're going to write about Brenstrom and like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Um, There's all these like possible, I mean, Phillies Astros obviously would have been a rematch of last year. And then instead we're getting one that's kind of, it's kind of tough to make connections between these two teams. You know what the the connection of these two teams is by very technical MLB standards? They are, uh, as MLB redid the interleague schedule and named natural rivals do you remember this the, no uh, not at all i remember you cared about this yeah so part of the new schedule was there's one interleague team that everyone plays four times instead of three times it's basically you know this is what the yankees and mets do the white Sox and cubs you know it's right. those types of oh, things. the two and two kind of series exactly yeah. so this is supposed to be the big interleague game but really they really only have <laughs> a few that make sense. So they just had to pair some teams up at the end. These teams are paired? And this is a pairing. <laughs> the Diamondbacks <Really? laughs> and Rangers is a pairing because it obviously used to be that the Rangers and the Astros were an interleague matchup, and that is right. not the case anymore. So these are the, the pairing. I went through before the season and was trying to come up with like a name for all of these series since, you know, Subway series freeway series those are all cool and like have a a conceit and it's fun and this was the last one because i could not figure out a conceit for this i went with i think the leather series because that's the only thing that would stand between a snake biting a ranger on the leg (laughs) Uh, (laughs) okay i feel like but it's pretty tortured right not much you can say about this like the wild like the um the old west 
It's like a yeah, old it's, West. Like, it's the, like a the yeah, saloon series. The saloon the, series. There we go. Maybe that's, that's it. pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, we'll work on it. Okay. Like a all right. I didn't know that. You learn something new every day. Yeah. Uh, before we actually get into the how the two CS is wrapped up and now the World Series that we're looking at, we got a little bit of news. The Padres are not bringing back Bob Melvin. I started by saying the Padres, and so I had to phrase it that way. Although the actual news is that the San Francisco Giants are hiring Bob Melvin, who has still got a year left on his contract with the San Diego Padres. By the end of the year, with the way that it had gone, and then also the reporting that was coming out, it became uh, fairly clear that keeping both Bob Melvin and A.J. Preller was going to be untenable. And I don't... I guess you could read this as like they chose AJ over Bob Melvin, but I don't know that it's that simple because it's like the situation was they were both under contract and and someone was either going to get fired or they were going to leave. And the Giants wanting to hire Bob Melvin feels like a convenient way for that to for them to separate. I do think it's interesting. They allowed him permission to interview, which was a nice sign of, yeah. This could end. <laughs> this could end. And then he interviewed and ha- was hired quite quickly. Like, oh, yeah. This was, I think, I think once we got the news that they were allowing him to interview, that uh, it was, shall we say, fait accompli, that perhaps there was some conversations happening prior to that news itself getting out, because that was like, what, yesterday? Two days ago? I, and, I have no idea. <laughs> and they are introducing him in a press conference, like, in 40 minutes, <laughs> 40 minutes Which, in San, in San you know, Francisco. They had the chance to do the funniest thing ever after and announcing like, a press Just conference. kidding. We're pushing it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Bob they could Melvin have... <laughs> has failed his physical. <laughs> He's got it right. Uh, I actually, so this is, I wish we had the, I wish we could tell you what's actually going to come out of this. But right before we started recording, I got an email, media advisory, AJ Preller media availability. Wednesday, October 25th, that's today, at 12 p.m. Pacific time. That's in like two and a half hours. Wonder what he's going to say. If you're listening to this podcast, what he's, what'd he say? How'd that go? <laughs> What's that like? What comes out of there? <laughs> Do they have a new manager? Uh, What's happening? We can, Is he yeah, stepping we can, down? Sp- no, no. <laughs> we can speculate on the new Padres manager. The, all the reporting indicates it's going to be an internal candidate, most likely. The The two big ones are Ryan Flaherty, the bench coach, who is on the younger side, was a player pretty recently, and was actually teammates with Manny Machado in Baltimore, uh, which I don't know if that's a selling point or a a not. But uh, then the other guy on staff that could easily assume that job is Mike Schilt, former Cardinals manager, who was let go in pretty confusing circumstances by the Cardinals and wound up on the Padres staff and, uh, you know, seems like he could just take over that job. So uh, what I want to know from you just quickly is, do you think Bob Melvin is an upgrade over Gabe Kapler, considering that the Giants roster is, you know, the Giants not roster. actually good? I do. Yeah, I this is a real, real vibe shift, as you said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do think. I I don't this is not actually to say that Bob Melvin is a downgrade. I think between the two of them, specifically just comparing Bob Melvin and Gabe Kapler, that Bob Melvin has a really wonderful reputation as a manager, and Gabe Kapler has a really bad reputation as a manager, and perhaps both of those are exaggerated. (laughs) (laughs) I'm serious. Like I think that's that is what I actually think, is that like Gabe Kapler is gonna be a perhaps unfairly remembered as a bad manager. And I don't know that that's accurate. I think a lot of that has to do with just his time in Philly, which is perhaps not as reflective as like his time in San Diego or San Francisco, which was more successful. And then when his time in San Francisco ended, that felt abrupt and perhaps undeserved. And Bob Melvin, on the other hand, I think has a really good reputation as being a wonderful manager from his time in Oakland, which is probably very well deserved. That has... We have not updated that prior. <laughs> maybe so, maybe Bob Melvin needs worse players to be good at his job. Maybe that's the real trick. 
So which he I, will have in San Francisco. So yes. <laughs> go right ahead. I do think I was talking about this with somebody else about like, would you want that San Diego job? Because the kind of like the, the sort of interesting industry conversation to have uh, is like, oh, my gosh, who would take that job after AJ's gone through however many managers in however many years? And I was like, absolutely, I would want that job because <laughs> a thing that we talked about last time we talked about the Padres is I bet this team's going to do better next year. They got a lot of really good players and regression to the mean says they're not going to like be as bad as they were this most recent year. This feels like in some ways at least for the very first year, a pretty cushy job <laughs> where all you got to do is run back the same team and probably they'll win more games than they did last year. And everyone will be like, oh my God, it was Bob Melvin's fault all along. No, it was just a bad year. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I think like, which is not to say that managing is ever easy, but I just think like, yeah, I'd take this job. It's got great players. It's got weird expectations based on a almost certainly fluky down year. And so you got a good fan base, you got great weather. I don't know. You got Don Orsillo. Yeah, What's that to love? The, <laughs> the thing with San Diego is just managing what the uh, sometimes over exuberant front office gives you, which, right. you know, I'm sure there are difficulties in that. I struggle to fathom how they could be as difficult as Bob Melvin made them seem. Uh you know, it, there could be, I think it's just a personal thing that did not work out between him and Preller. He wasn't happy with the situation. I think he'll probably be happier in San Francisco where Farhan Zaidi uh, is in charge of the front office, at least for now. And they work together in Oakland. I'm sure that Bob Melvin will get to shuffle his little mediocre players around as much as he wants and uh, can run his clubhouse in a more uh, autonomous way, perhaps, than he could with so many big names in San Diego. So I think it will, you know, I'll just, I think this will work out great for San Diego and will change nothing for San Francisco. (laughs) That makes it sound like it was Bob Melvin's fault that they were bad. And I don't think think it's Bob Melvin's fault at all. I think this this is a thing with manager situations. They usually do not have that much sway over such large uh, storylines. And so when they move and then whatever was going to happen is going to happen pretty much. (laughs) And it's going to look worse for Bob Melvin than it is. That's kind of my point about like, right. I, I I, I think the failures are always more the responsibility of the general manager than they are of the manager. And so I think the Padres underperformance this year in so far as it's attributed to anyone other than the players is attributed to to AJ Preller. But yeah, I think it's probably a really great time. Like if if anything, you're buying low on the Padres if you're the Padres manager, because you got so many good players. How could they not be better than they were last year? Uh, Okay. And I really, I'm very, I I wonder what AJ is going to say now two hours and 31 minutes mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> should we should we talk about the the cs's let's talk about the cs's we can we can start with the one that ended earlier which was yours the alcs the the rangers right. and the astros the adolis garcia special only we should say it only ended earlier because it started earlier they both won seven games only yes. what i've seen this stat floating around so i'm basing it entirely off how tweets what four times that they fourth they've, time fourth time history, that they've yeah. they've both gone seven games so really from a baseball writer's perspective the worst possible series to go the distance I'd, I'd take a three game <laughs> wild card a five game division series and a seven game World Series all of them over a seven game uh, LCS which takes you right up to the World Series and then you're tired um, but that's fine it was exciting it was good I mean game six was exciting game seven was no game five was exciting game five was the good one game six was fine I don't remember it and game seven was fine. <laughs> it's a blowout. <laughs> um, the well, let's see. No one, no one was happy because only road teams won. Conveniently, they were only a few hours apart, so presumably there were some Astros fans in Arlington and some Rangers fans in Houston. There were because uh, it was a repeat of 2019 World Series in that only that the road team won every single game and that Max Scherzer pitched and that Max Scherzer was just good enough for us to be like impressed that he pitched but not I think make it, him the story. <laughs> it is officially interesting that the two series where the road team won every game, <laughs> both 
was the Astros losing with home field advantage. Like, yes, there is something weird with that. And they their really, regular season wasn't good at home this year. No, either. I'm like, they might think that does protest too much. They're like, we are not stealing signs at home. We are <laughs> terrible here. I'm like, you've overshot it. Go back. <laughs> That's not what's happening. Just to be clear. <laughs> um, all right. What happened was Adolis Garcia... We got it. So we should just talk about from game five on. I don't even remember when the last time we spoke was. This was probably before. It was after game two. All right. Well, some other stuff happened. The Astros won the first two games in uh, Arlington. And then they also won the third game in Arlington. But that was the more interesting one. So that one. Well, first of all, we should say they, they won the first game in Arlington, which was game three. I guess Max Scherzer was pitching. He didn't pitch well. Okay. Anyway, game, game five. This is well, you look confused. Am I, what am I saying wrong? Uh. I, yeah, I was just making sure I got that right. Yes. Okay. I didn't know which team you were talking. I didn't. I lost the pronouns. You said they a lot, and I didn't uh, know which team you were okay. talking about. The, well, here's how the series went. The Rangers <laughs> won the first two games in Houston, and everybody was like, oh, my God, it's going to be another sweep. It was not. Um, then they went home. They had won all of their postseason games at that point. They being the Rangers. The Rangers went home to Arlington. The Rangers had won every single postseason game at that point. The Rangers had only played, what, like one game at home at that point? And then they, the Rangers, lost all three of their games at home, which was Arlington, low play field. Um, <laughs> and the first one was started by Max Scherzer, uh, who was coming off of over a month of not pitching and didn't pitch well. He was not great. Uh, and he, it was an interesting, not great. If, if they had lost, we would have talked about this way more. So we don't have to like spend too much time on it. Although it will, I guess, be relevant sort of going forward into the World Series. What was interesting was his velocity was good. So he probably felt fine. It's like kind of the only like real external metric you can have. And also he said, I feel fine. But his his slider wasn't good. And also he just was ineffective. Uh, and probably that was rust. Like that's kind of like a, it probably feels fine. He probably rested long enough to be healthy, but. He, instead of making a rehab start, pitched in the postseason <laughs> um, against the Astros, who are quite good, and didn't last very long, and they lost that game, and then they lost the next game, and then that brings us to game five. That's the Adolis Garcia gets hit by a baseball game. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're enough past this that people have seen that. Adolis Garcia got hit by Brian Abreu, and instantly, instantly, this is, I think, a key detail, instantly was like that was on purpose like immediately turned to martin maldonado the catcher yelled at him got his face the bench is cleared they brawled it was not a particularly like violent brawl um but it they was skirmished a, they skirmished like, but it, it was yeah. an impactful brawl in that jose leclerc who at that point had had an incredible postseason he had pitched in every single one of the rangers wins had come in to pitch the very end of the top of the eighth this was the bottom of the eighth they needed Jose Leclerc to pitch the top of the ninth. And Jose Leclerc had to sit and wait for this whole skirmish and then for the people to get ejected and for the umpires to get together and talk about these things. And then for Dusty Baker to not leave the dugout after he got ejected. And then when he came back out, he gave up a go-ahead home run to Jose Altuve and the Astros won that game. All right. Did he? Did Jose Abreu hit Adolis Garcia on purpose? What do you think? I... I'm still sort of on the no, but uh, <laughs> it, which, you know, I will mention Abreu hit another batter yes. very unintentionally in pretty much the exact same way the next time he pitched, yes. which I just, you know, took note of. I, I did think, hmm, wow, Galaxy Brain. He hit that guy on purpose so that way we wouldn't think he hit the other guy on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's a great call, actually. I would do that, too. Well, um, the, the Galaxy Brain <laughs> thing I thought during the brawl was that Martin Maldonado called for Adolis Garcia to get hit because they knew yeah, they wanted to ice the pitcher and, yeah. and wanted to create a delay. Yeah, and we worked. I really, it I mean, very much work. Okay, we're kind of kidding, but we should get into, like, the evidence for each side. So the, the primary evidence for it wasn't on purpose was... That would be really dumb to do. The Astros were down by two. It was four to two. It was the eighth inning. The Astros are plenty capable of scoring two runs. I don't remember who it was. It was Evan Carter. Evan Carter was on first. So the Rangers had a guy on first. Would you want to put another runner on? No, of course not. Um, it's a very important game. However, people do dumb things all the time. The fact that it's dumb doesn't mean that it wasn't... Not prohibitive. Not, yeah. not prohibitive. Um, also, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to character slander 
Brian Abreu, who I don't know personally. So I'm going to say that a reason he wouldn't do that is because maybe he doesn't want to hurt anyone. And it was like a 99 mile an hour pitch, we should say. Um, all right. I would say that this is like a little bit of a, it's on purpose because they say it's on purpose, but I do think, I, I think I, oh gosh, I feel that almost bad. I think I net out saying, I think it was on purpose because first of all, Adolis Garcia could not have been more sure in the moment that it was on purpose. We we missed a key detail, which is that Adolis Garcia hit a home run earlier in the inning or in the, earlier in the game and stood and watched it for a really long time. And Adolis Garcia and all of the other Rangers post game were quite sure that this was a direct cause and effect that Adolis Garcia had been having has had been having and went on to have and even more so an excellent uh, ALCS and. That included hitting some very cool home runs. And he pimped the hell out of this one. And then they got hit. They were like, that's why he got hit. Also, they there was some drama earlier in the year in which like Marcus Semien got in Martin Maldonado's face after he scored on a Aldous Garcia Grand Slam, but had gotten hit early in the game. Whatever. Okay. So point in favor of it being on purpose. Adolis Garcia, quite sure it was on purpose. And he, he just got hit by 99 mile an hour pitch. So he might be inclined to see some <laughs> negative intent, intent there. Yeah. So skip ahead. He gets suspended two games. And the Abreu does. Abreu does. And the suspension is upheld. Goes to an arbiter. They, they, they do the arbitration pre-game, game seven, so we can figure out if he's going to be available. Um, we'll talk about that later. And they uphold both games. You know? Often these things get, when you're suspended two games and you appeal the suspension. You get one game. You often get one game. I'm assuming that someone brought some evidence and that the person who brought evidence was perhaps the umpires. There were six of them because it's a postseason who were close enough to hear something that was said potentially. All six of them also after game five, um, the umpires spoke to the media and or one of them did the crew chief and made a point to say it was a unanimous decision. All six umpires thought it was on purpose. So, this is not I mean, this is not like an anti-Astros conspiracy theory. The Astros fans are very concerned that people are uh, maligning them unfairly. But I just think like, I don't know. I, I don't. The evidence for it not being on purpose is so obvious, which is why would you do that? That I think if they're like, yeah, that's definitely on purpose. Everyone here agrees that was on purpose. We all think that was on purpose. We took it to an arbitrator. <laughs> Each side made their case and their result was it was on purpose. Then there has to be some evidence that we're just like lacking. Also. And this gets back to your thing about Martin Maldonado and the galaxy brain. I was not in the Astros clubhouse, but other people were and they got quotes. I was in the Rangers clubhouse. Makes these things tricky. Martin Maldonado was asked about like, and the other Astros were too, like, did this fire you guys up? Like, because they went on to win. They won, uh, won in dramatic ninth inning fashion. And he said yes. And I kind of thought, oh, that's a bad answer if you're trying to claim it wasn't on, on purpose. So... Like, I, I mean, think if you're downplaying, you're, you're like, I, I don't even know why there was a fight brawl. You, yeah, if someone tries to fight you, I think it fires you up regardless of whether you started it or not, right? Yes, but I think if they were trying to make the argument that this was, like, completely unreasonable, and, I mean, maybe not, maybe I'm thinking, like, a response to a media call. But I just mean, like, I was I was very, like, from a baseball players tend to, tend to avoid the narratives. Everyone shirks the things we want them to say. That would be most interesting <laughs> perspective. I was quite sure that asked about, like, oh, and do you think that the, do you think the fight is why you guys went on to win? That they would be like, no, we're a good team. Like, we just want to put this in the past. You know, we want to, we want to forget that. Like, but then they were like, yeah, we <laughs> loved it. I mean, baseball players do love a fight. I, they, they love a, 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 a bonding brawl. They really see it as a chance to like, I don't know, prove how on the same side they are. You're wearing the same outfits. We know you're on the same side. You're wearing the same outfits. <laughs> okay, that was a lot of time on that one inning. But basically what happened is that happened and that was the end of the Arlington portion of the series. We had a travel day. We had two more games. At that point, the Astros had taken a three games to two lead in the series and on a quite emphatic ninth inning note after beating the Rangers three times in a row in their home, heading back to Houston. It was like, oh my God, they're going to win. They're, they're riding the momentum, blah, 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 blah. They did not. The Rangers won. And <laughs> mostly what happened was Adoles Garcia hit a lot of home runs. 
He had two in the last game. He admired those two. He also (laughs) admired his singles that could have been doubles if he wasn't admiring (laughs) them so much. This was like the last two games of the series were excellent character building for Adolis Garcia. Starting with that like last at bat in the eighth of the previous game where he got hit. He then in game five, no, game six. So he gets hit in game five, game six, strikes out four times to start the game. And every single time, I've never heard someone get booed as consistently. I mean, like, not consistently and every time he came up to bat. I mean, like, the Astros fans were booing him from the second he left the on-deck circle to the when he turned around and walked back to the dugout because he didn't get struck out. They brought their free Brian Abreu signs. They were <laughs> booing the crap out of Adolis Garcia, and he was striking out. Golden Sobrero, four strikeouts in a row. Oh my gosh, the Astros are getting to him. They can't take the pressure, blah, blah. And then he hits a grand slam in the last at-bat. It was, to be honest, not a super necessary grand slam. They were going to win anyway. (laughs) But it was was a fun one. And then game seven comes out, drives in a run with a single that he thought was a home run. That could have been a double, but instead it was a single because he thought it was a home run. So he stood in the box for too long. And then he was like, sorry about that, and stole second base. Which is good. That's the right way you should handle it when you screw up. And then he hit two more home runs, and he was the ALCS MVP. This is we've exclusively spoken about Dulles Garcia. Other people play too, but that's basically it. Yeah, he has. Uh, he is both friends, countrymen, uh, with Randy Rosarena, who did pretty much this same thing in the 2020 World uh, Playoffs. I don't think Randy Rosarena fought anybody. But other than that, uh, very similar narrative arc. And uh, it feels like Adolis Garcia is going to be the baseball player whose Q score goes up the most from this postseason. I I think, you know, we we still have a little bit to go. It could be someone else, but it feels like he is closing in on that particular honor. And he has a really interesting backstory that involves Cardinals giving up on him. The Rangers also kind of giving up on him, but ending up stuck with him anyway. And now I'm sure they're glad about that. And um, they have enough pitching, at least to have survived. They have Jordan Montgomery. They have Nathan Eovaldi. Eovaldi pitched game six. Jordan Montgomery came out of the bullpen in game seven. And Max Scherzer started game seven and was fine. Going into game seven, everybody was like, wow, it's going to be the Max Scherzer game. Here he is. He's coming back. He had a bad start. This is just like 2019 when he pitched in game seven after he was hurt. Um, and it wasn't about him at all. He, he was like fine for two and a third or something like that. What do you want to know? Anything? Because you weren't there. Is like any anything from the outside that's intriguing you? Uh, I mean, I think you gave a pretty good recap there. I, I Is there panic around the Rangers about Jose Leclerc? Um, being broken now because he really has not looked good. Uh, he pitched again after the Jose Altuve yes. thing, and it also did not go well. It was just okay because the Rangers were up by 11 billion runs. Yeah, I think there was some consternation around having him pitch in that Game 7 because they were up by so much. So they don't have a lot of um, relievers that they trust in that bullpen right now. <laughs> and... Jose Leclerc is one of them that they do trust, which is good, and they should. Uh, he, other than that one game, had given them a little reason to not trust him. However, I do think I would get him rest when I can, considering he pitched in, like, every single game for the first, like, what, seven, eight games, nine games of the postseason. So that, we got, we got a few days off for the World Series. He had a few days in between. I just think, so whether or not they still trust him, I think they're going to have to, because they don't trust anybody else. They keep pitching a role as Chapman, man, so... Says <laughs> they're willing yeah. to get burned, apparently. <laughs> the, I don't know if you remember Bruce Bochy's r- bullpen tendencies with the Giants. This is a podcast about the Giants now. In the <laughs> those three World Series they won, he had Sergio Romo and he had Javier Lopez, the lefty, and I swear those guys pitched twice a night, every night. I mean, th- they were always. And it feels like he's doing that a little bit with Josh Sabors. Yeah, who has and- been great. And Jose Leclerc, where you got to try someone else sometimes, man. You can't, you're, this is going to not go great eventually. Uh, this is like a very stupid, this is not an, an inexpert thing for me to say, but every time Roldis Chapman comes in, I'm like, do they 
have anyone else? Do they have a <laughs> do they have a position player who's pitched it's a in the three past? Man, <laughs> like three I'm, man like I'm, I'm like, it's like, do you have a, a, a bench player who could who could eat some <laughs> innings? Like truly. Because this guy cannot get it over the plate. He he also hit someone. He, he uh but that one no one thought was on purpose because no. <laughs> it's just how he's been lately. So that's where they're at. I did see, I think, I think it was Buster only tweeted something that was like ahead of game seven, Madison Bumgarner of the Giants. Formerly. Oh, almost of the D-backs. That would have been a connection with Bruce Bochy, but not. Um, okay. Well, he will get a ring he if will the get D-backs win. Um, yeah. but, but that he had texted Bruce Bochy to be like, I can pitch. And everyone was like, ha, ha, ha. And I was like, no, but really, can he? Because <laughs> <laughs> they could use the help. Okay, that's the ALCS. Uh, the Astros lost. Here, okay, I want to just say something about the Astros and then we want to talk about it. In that game, I had the thought. I was there. I was covering it. I often think, should I actually be writing about the team that's going to get eliminated? Because they're done. Their season's over. Now we know how their season goes. It happens a lot early. That's what I did when the Phillies eliminated the Braves. I wrote about the Braves because they're the Braves. And as discussed earlier, they were quite good. And them getting eliminated is interesting. I briefly felt the same way about the Astros getting eliminated. I was like, I should probably write about that. The reigning champions are getting eliminated. The Astros are still... The Astros kept their ALCS streak alive, and that is a level of dominance that I do not think is undone by coming one game short of the World Series. I don't think they need to have like a serious reckoning. They might want to have like a longer term reckoning because their farm system is not so good and a lot of these guys are getting older. But in the kind of looking ahead to 2024 sense, I don't think we need to be like, like everyone build this as the Rangers slaying the dragon. And they did in that they beat their division rival who I think beat them last year in the division by like 38 games or something like that. And the Astros, they're the reigning champions. They're quite good. The, everyone everyone is on board with the billing of the American League as it runs through Houston and it does and they beat them. So they should feel great about that. But I just think like we don't need to panic that the Astros sort of dynasty or storyline or oh they're over they're not they they made it to game seven of the alcs after making it to their seventh alcs in a row it's quite good yeah it will however remember uh, remember when the red sox slayed the dragon in 2018 how'd that work out for them right exactly so i just think like the astros they're still the astros are still the astros and like next year if the astros are in the division series and you're asking me to make predictions i'll probably be like well they'll probably make the alcs again because they keep doing that all right let's talk about the nl so the Arizona Diamondbacks, man, uh, the last we spoke, they were down 2-0, and, and they were down a decisive 2-0. They had gotten just pummeled in Game 2 in Philadelphia. I think it was a 10 nothing loss. Uh, that meant Zach Gallon and Merrill Kelly had lost their first starts of the series. We went to Arizona. They had Brandon Fott, a rookie, who had a 5.79 ERA this year, starting against Ranger Suarez, who's a pretty proven postseason performer for the Phillies. And Brandon Fott was amazing. Uh, so, so Brandon Fott broke the Phillies. Ranger Suarez was really good, too. They both went uh, into the sixth inning scoreless in game three, and it was sort of a weird, everyone got a couple guys to third base, and only the Diamondbacks drove in their guys. So they edged the Phillies in game three. And then... They won game four pretty solidly, and it felt like, okay, maybe this is the inverse home field advantage series. It's, well, the home team's just going to win, which when we go back to Philly, that means it'll be easy. The Phillies will win. Uh, The Phillies took game five in Arizona because Zach Wheeler has been tremendous. Uh, And Zach Allen. But I think the. Yeah, Zach Allen has not been amazing. So the real twist, I think, comes with. Game six, the the Diamondbacks oh. at some point, you know, Paul Seawald talked about the pitchers making an adjustment to how the Phillies hitters were approaching the postseason at bats, which, you know, I tried to write as much as I could about that Phillies approach because it it's not simple. It's very individualized, but the basis of it was basically they were going up there hunting for the pitch that they personally could hit for a home run and it if it came on the first pitch like they were going to swing at it if it came on the second pitch they were going to swing at it if it didn't come in the at bat they were going to try to stand there and not do anything Uh, you know there was a very specific way the Phillies were hitting that was working really well and the Diamondbacks kind of got around it 
They started to throw them a lot of sinkers on the edge. They started to make them chase. They started to throw them cutters more, just fewer fastballs, more pitches that were looking good and dropping out of the zone. You know, a bunch of their pitchers had these really kind of backwards, very stretched arsenals that they were using to to make it more difficult for the Phillies to sit on anything uh, effectively. And they they shut them down. I, Kyle Schwarber was still getting his hits. Uh, he was very locked in. Mike Hayes and the Diamondbacks GM mentioned Kyle Schwarber during the, the post-game celebration as like, Kyle Schwarber almost got us. But the rest of them, you know, they really shut down the Phillies with runners in scoring position. And they kept sort of doing their thing the the last two games in philly are the first time the diamondbacks looked like the diamondbacks from the whole season they were stealing bases they were hitting singles they were you know playing great defense and i think everyone in philly wound up a little bit stunned because they thought you know not to besmirch the the atmosphere in philly is amazing home field advantage is not that big a thing in baseball it isn't it is at maximum three percent Really, and I think everyone in Philly was starting to, you know, drink their own Kool Aid of Mm -hmm. we have an eighty-five percent chance of winning every time we play at Citizens Bank Park, and the Diamondbacks uh, put a stake through that idea. It did. I mean, they had a a a retroactive one hundred percent chance of winning until this point, right? These were the first games at home. I think they lost this this season. season. Yeah, Yeah. which is the same. I mean, I guess the last year. Last year, what happened was they didn't lose any games at home until they lost a series, and it just happened to come in the World Series. Until uh, the, the Astros no hit them at home. Yes. Yeah. Who is other? So, explain. So, Merrill Kelly was good, and Brandon Fott. He, he was, was good. good in the game six. He was bad in game two. Great. So, who's pitching? How are they winning? Because Zach Allen was not good. Zach no Allen offense. was not good in either start, and it feels like maybe they did not figure out the best adjustment for him. He's a fastball heavy pitcher. He's fastball command. And I'm not sure there's anywhere you can command the fastball, a four seam fastball in the zone and win against the Phillies. That's just not (laughs) the correct plan of attack. Uh, So he, he still struggled, but the main thing is Brandon fought, gave them really good innings. And, and he seemed actually the best equipped of all of the diamondbacks pitchers. And I wonder if they learned this directly from watching him he doesn't throw many balls in the zone, mm. uh, not usually on purpose, but he he just throws really bendy, crazy, hard to control stuff. And the Phillies really struggled with it because it looks, you know, his breaking ball will look like a, a fastball that's pretty good, low, ready to swing. And then it ends up in the dirt or like hitting them in the kneecap. And they were still swinging because it's such a sharp pitch. Uh, you know, his changeup has a lot of good dropping action. So they started replicating that Uh, and the Diamondbacks bullpen, which was crushed in the early part of this series, but has otherwise actually been good this postseason. They just, they kept them on schedule. I mean, Tori Lavallo nailed the entrances and exits of these relievers over and over and over again. I, I, the only one who really kind of got dicey a few times was Andrew Saul Frank, who's in like his 10th major league game ever and was like, here, go get Bryce Harper and Kyle Schwarber three times in a series. Uh, so he had some tough assignments, but Ryan Thompson, the Rays cast off has been amazing. He went uh, across innings a couple times in really big spots. Kevin Ginkle was maybe the biggest hero other than Corbin Carroll in game seven. Uh, he shut down the top of the Phillies order at the end of the game and Paul Seawald's been good throughout the postseason, the closer that they traded for at the deadline. So uh, it's, it's sort of, they figured out an adjustment to deal with the Phillies. I don't think it's like they're necessarily world beaters who will automatically figure out the Rangers, but I think you have to be encouraged by the fact that they did that in the middle of a series, figured it out on the fly. And certainly you feel better now about Brandon fought as a number three starter. He has unlocked something that, with his stuff, Brent Strom moved him to the other side of the rubber in the middle of the season, and he's been better since then. It it feels like he is pitching in a way that you basically have to throw out what you thought you knew about him coming into the series. Yeah, I only got to watch that last game on TV, and I really enjoyed 
Ron Darling talking about Brendan Fodd. I was like, wow, that's a really good. I, and watching a uh, postseason broadcast when you have been covering them in person is like a very <laughs> enjoyable and satisfying experience. Um, anything else? I was going to say the, the other. Yeah. The other thing I, uh, you know, should mention Corbin Carroll and Gabriel Moreno. Oh, right. Yeah. We should talk yeah. about Corbin Carroll. I will say real quick. I, actually, sorry. I had one thing I wanted to say about that, which is mm-hmm. we probably shouldn't talk about Tori Lovello and not talk about Bruce Bochy in terms of like managers. But I I really came to enjoy Tori Lovello as a character. This series, I don't know him that well. I don't know. I'm not near Phoenix. Um, I don't see them that much. And. I think everybody else did too. I think this is like a like a a not uncommon sentiment that Tori Lovello, the Diamondbacks manager, was a wonderful character in the extremely kind of David and Goliath Phillies versus D backs matchup in which the D backs emerged victorious. All of the quotes and clips and whatever that I saw of him were just I'm really looking forward to him getting a bigger stage, even though I know he's looking forward to his players getting a bigger stage. But I'm just, I was enjoying, I was enjoying that. Like we're going to have, we're going to have Bruce Bochy versus Tori Lovello in the world series. And it's going to be some great manager quotes. That's all. <laughs> there, there are going to be some good manager quotes. We can kind of talk about the two young major D back stars as part of just like previewing how the series is going to go. If the diamondbacks are going to win the world series, they're going to get, their offense from Cattell Marte, who was crazy in this series, the rest of the postseason veteran. He hits all the time. He's been great. But the real swing points of the Diamondbacks score two runs and Cattell Marte is the best player in a loss to the Diamondbacks have won the World Series. The swing point is Corbin Carroll playing like he did. You know, he doesn't have to play all the way like he did in game seven. He won the game single handedly. He drove in two runs, scored two runs, stole two bases and caught the final out. It's like, well, OK, good job, man. Uh, but he and Gabriel Moreno, the young catcher who's been hitting line drives all over the place, they have been batting either first and third or second and third in the order, depending on the handedness of the starter. And that is the case for the Diamondbacks being both better than 84 wins is the improvement of these guys. It's the case for them being relevant as an ongoing concern beyond this year. That's going to keep getting better. They're both 23. It, this is, this is the young core of the diamondbacks who could threaten in the NL West in the NL for years. The, it's those two guys, Brandon fought, you know, some other guys on the periphery, Alec Thomas, but those are the guys to watch if you're wondering if the Diamondbacks can can do this. Do you think they can? I kind of do. I don't, you know, we're going to test the Rangers bullpen in the series. It, you know, the Astros did pretty well against it, had some big moments against that bullpen. And the Diamondbacks bullpen has been way better. I feel way better about the Diamondbacks bullpen than the Rangers bullpen. And I feel, you know... <laughs> I feel way better about the the Rangers offense than the Diamondbacks offense. Uh, But sometimes that, you know, it's pretty hard to do tail of the tape type type stuff for baseball, because if the pitching, you know, keeps it to no runs, then, uh, well, yeah, (laughs) doesn't matter how much better the offense. It's really, really hard to do matchups, honestly, in baseball, because it's not like they're going to run at each other in the way they do with football. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to get like a, well, this is how that team approaches offense, and thus they are a great match for their team. Like, it's like, the, yeah. you know what I mean? It, right. It's like, they're all trying to, they're all trying to, yeah. So it doesn't, it's really, really hard. Like, it's like, if the Rangers end up scoring off the D-backs bullpen, it's like, well, did the bullpen get worse, or is this just a really good lineup? Like, it's like, it's that, that part is very tricky. I think, it's really hard to tell like how teams match up against one another. I think what's really interesting about these seven game series is like baseball teams never play each other this many times in a row. And we really saw it getting to see two seven game series. Like there's a lot that is unique to the postseason in that respect. We think of the postseason as being unique because it's such a small sample size, but then on a series level, it's a really long sample size. So things like we talk a lot about like third time through the order for starters, but then in, in seven game series, you get into kind of like how many times has the relievers been seen by every hitter and like that kind of exposure starts to have an effect as well. So that makes it seem like the you got to give it to the offense, which would be the Rangers in this case. 
assuming they go seven games, it's entirely possible that, right, like the D-backs bullpen, I guess, just shuts them down and their pitching is good. The Rangers should have more pitching than they do. The, I have written this this theme so many times, and you and I wrote it together in the regular season. What's the deal with the Rangers this year? Oh, you can never have too much pitching. It's what the CY, the general manager, says all the time. It's the whole vibe of they replaced their whole rotation, and then they got hurt, and so they replaced them again. And now some of those guys are back. And I'm like, but so how many? Where's all the pitching? Two of pitching? them are good. Two of them are good. Jordan Montgomery and Nathan Ivaldi have been getting like the one-two starts in every series, and they have been phenomenal. Ivaldi in particular. And then they've gone to, in general, they've done like some kind of like Andrew Heaney, Dane Dunning, piggyback, avoid a full bullpen day type game, which has worked and not worked to variable success. And now they've added Max Scherzer into the mix. They do also have John Gray back, who pitched poorly out of the bullpen in that Max Scherzer start in game three. They also have like Martin Perez, who's hanging out in the bullpen, who we haven't seen yet. Like they should. Who was, have... who was on the last Rangers World Series yes. team, by the way? Congratulations yes. to Martin Perez, Rangers legend. He and uh, Jose Leclerc are the only two team, only two guys who were on that 2016 2016 team, and Leclerc did not play in the postseason. So they technically have a lot of starters floating around, and they 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 only really trust a couple of them. I mean. You could make an argument that for as hard as it is to do the like things that are going to determine the series, because like you don't know, maybe Adolis Garcia hits five home runs in four games or something, and then that's you didn't predict that ahead of the ALCS. But I think if anything, the easiest like thing that will determine this series from the Rangers' perspective, from I think, is just like is Max Scherzer good still? Like, can they? Can he be? Can it go? Jordan Montgomery, Nathan Yavaldi, Max Scherzer, and then you got three really good starters who can go six innings and save your bullpen for worse starters games. You know what I mean? Like, because two, two really good starters, and particularly good starters who go deep. Uh, in game one of the ALCS, we had like the, the first game where both starters went six because it was Verlander on the other side. Like, that's great. That's, and that's what the Rangers need as a team that has a bad bullpen. And a third one of those, especially one that they went out and traded for in the same way they traded for Jordan Montgomery to be in this situation. Like, that is, when we talk about, like, the Rangers as a team that intended to be here, they made the, they are here on purpose in the same way. Like, they spent a lot of money. They did a lot of trading. They were like, we need to be good this year. Max Scherzer pitching in the postseason and being like a starting pitcher you feel really good about having to start in a big game. That's part of the on purpose. Like if if for it to work, he needs to do that. And he was better, maybe, maybe, or maybe they just left him in for less time in the <laughs> second start. Uh, so maybe he's working back towards that. I don't know. I'm not trying to be like too Max Scherzer centric because I know he's like such a big postseason character. But the lineup is really good up and down. Like, they, as we saw, they can win without really Marcus Semien and Corey Seager doing well. If they do do well, then they'll probably win because those two guys have like AL MVP potential um, and they really did nothing for the first six games of the CS that they still ended up winning. Corey Seager really turned it on for the last game, which proved to be key. So like, but there are a lot of really good hitters in the lineup and there are two at least really good starters and the bullpen is not good. And then I think, I think like that third starter, and maybe it's not Max. Maybe it's Andrew Heaney getting a full start. Maybe it's Martin Perez. No, it's probably not. I I, I was going to say, I think the key, you know, you're talking about that for the Rangers. I think the key for the Diamondbacks is exactly what you said about the Rangers lineup. In the Phillies lineup, even though it's very good and Bryce Harper and Kyle Schwarber were going insane, they had breaks. There were... they. They kept getting Johan Rojas, which, you know, he's in the lineup for his defense. No one expected him to be an amazing hitter against postseason competition. But the Diamondbacks kept finding ways to get Johan Rojas out in key situations. They kept finding ways to get Alec Bohm and Bryson Stott out in key situations. And those guys are good hitters who were having down moments. And that's what they need from the Rangers because there are no breaks. There's no Johan Rojas in the Rangers right. lineup. They're the closest guy to the to that for them is Leody Tavares, their center fielder, and he's been much better. He's been a very good offensive player this postseason and for most of the second half. So there there's not a guy, you know, you cannot pitch carefully around Jonah Heim to get to the number seven or eight hitter for the right. Rangers. I mean, you can, but just won't work out that well for you. Uh, and so I think that's the 
the riddle. We just don't know how the Diamondbacks are going to solve that. I do think uh, I haven't totally looked at the park factors around this, but I believe both Texas and I know Arizona play bigger. They play harder to hit home runs in than Philly uh, and certainly than Houston. And I think that works to the Diamondbacks pitcher's advantage a bit. Uh, They have tremendous outfield range, uh, especially Alec Thomas, who is like a vacuum cleaner uh, in the outfield. And so I'll be interested to see if they pitch a little bit more to contact in Texas as opposed to uh, trying to pitch carefully. We'll have to see how the first two games go, but that would be the thing I'd watch for the Diamondbacks. Yeah, I was just looking at the the Rangers lineup while you were talking on, on fan graphs, got their like uh, postseason leader portraits now, which are fun to, to play around with. If you look at it, so if you throw out Robbie Grossman, who only has 19 plate appearances, then the Rangers only have three guys with a WRC plus under 100. It's Nathaniel Lowe, Jonah Heim, and Marcus Semyon. And Semyon, that's surprising. He's a, he's a very good player. He was like the second behind Shohei Otani in Fangraphs War uh, in the regular season. So like Semyon could just turn it, on turn it on starting on Friday. And then suddenly, and Nathaniel Lowe, who's got an 86 WRC plus for the postseason, was a lot better in the LCS than he was earlier in the postseason. And Jonah Heim is a really good catcher who, you know, okay, fine. Uh, hasn't been great. But like, yeah, it's very, very few breaks and... On the flip side of that, if Marcus Semien, who they are continuing to stick with as the leadoff hitter, as Bruce Bochy's want to do, he does have to be, you gotta, you can't have your leadoff hitter being the one guy then who's not, who's like below league average. That's not great. Yes, I should say that Nathaniel Lowe has a 122 WRC plus in the ALCS. So it's, it got better. That's a good lineup. It's a really good lineup, man. It's a really good lineup. Uh, Evan Carter's so much fun. Evan Carter and Corbin Carroll is a nice little matchup of dudes who aren't very big or very old who yeah. do everything well, except uh, Corbin Carroll can't throw the ball. But other than that, we saw some good. We saw some good uh, Evan Carter defense early in the CS. We saw some not so good Evan Carter defense. I got to be honest. <laughs> later in the the CS, I think we get, got a little bit. Everyone got a little bit overhyped about um, how good he was. As a team, the Texas Rangers uh, had the best WRC plus in the postseason at 124. Then it goes Philly. Then it goes Houston. Where is Arizona? <laughs> Probably not that high. They're, they're fifth. They're fifth. They're good they at have, scoring runs without yeah. hitting it that hard. Yeah. So I just, I think you got to have a better offense than that to win the world series but 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 doubting the d-backs have been you know snakes alive um i would i would never <laughs> all right uh who should neutral fans root for this is actually tough because these are these are two teams really that are likable in different ways and also i think probably a lot of neutral fans don't have strong opinions on them yeah i think there's an interesting uh if you want to not have the oh, there's no point in spending money conversation all off season, which people were trying to have because the Mets and Padres missed the playoffs. You may be rude for the Rangers because yeah. they spent a crap load of money. Uh, they're a top five payroll in baseball and they would, they should, they won't because people say what they want to say regardless of whether it's true, but uh, they would really squash that narrative and that idea of like ah spending money doesn't work in baseball and no it works fine uh, having Corey Seager and Jordan Montgomery and Nathan Yavaldi and all these guys is like they would be sitting at home if they didn't have those guys right. uh but I no I'm I'm going with the D-backs I I think they're they're really fun they're really young I think they're going to continue to be relevant uh and if in terms of exciting thrilling baseball like pressure moments they're like the uh you know in honor of tori lavello who talks about college basketball coaches like at least once a day he never gets through a press conference without bringing up a college basketball coach somehow or like basketball in some form they're like the team that gets into the ncaa tournament and then runs the full court press to where you just go absolutely insane because they won't leave you alone that's how the diamondbacks play baseball somehow And I think it's pretty fun to watch. Uh, I think there's several guys who 
you're going to see, you're going to learn who, who are pretty dynamic at all moments in their games. You know, Gabriel Moreno is a high average hitter as a catcher, and he throws guys out better than anyone else in baseball this year. Carroll is, you know, everyone sort of knows Corbin Carroll now, but I think they're going to be the more fun team to watch try to win this thing. I don't know if they'll win, but I think get over the 84 win thing, get over the whether it is reflective of the season. The Diamondbacks, you know, they are kind of the ultimate Cinderella story in a way that the last time we had a bad, you know, a close to 500 team that won the World Series, it was the Cardinals and they're never fun. The Diamondbacks are actually fun, so they can actually be the Cinderella. I think that the Diamondbacks are the cool choice from like an inside baseball perspective. We already talked about this for a while, but and this is very much your whole point about the D-backs, but like this is like a good get in on the ground floor type with the D-backs. Like they're young, they're fun, they could be here a while. They they are it's not a star-studded World Series, I will say. <laughs> um, and it's not a star-studded D-backs team, certainly. I think they are you're right. They are your true Cinderella story. They are your true nobody believed in them. Like even as recently as ahead of game Tuesday. seven in which yeah. they were one win away from the world series. Nobody <laughs> believed in them. I think as, as the person who's, I guess, repping the AL at this point, the case for the Rangers is like, if you're a true casual fan and you're want to watch the world series after not paying a ton of attention, like you got your Bruce Bochy, you got Max Scherzer and like, you got a lot of like, home run hitters guys who have been around a while like it's a real like i actually think the rangers are like a pretty low barrier to entry team if only from the perspective of like these pitchers have been elsewhere so maybe you already watched <laughs> them type like maybe you're a red sox fan could you root for nathan Eovaldi on the rangers like and i think like the you know what i mean it's like you've seen nathan Eovaldi in the postseason you've seen bruce bochi in the postseason you've seen max scherzer in the postseason you, you've, you've seen, seen Corey, Corey Seager. Seager hit dingers and win a world series in this ballpark exactly like if you are a true like neutral fan who prefers to watch the world series or the postseason than like you know all 162 regular season games the rangers have a lot of a lot of entry points for you in terms of just like you've seen these people in the postseason before they're fun um and also they've still somehow never managed to win a world series so they have like an interesting juxtaposition between like guys who have won world series and the <laughs> team has never won the world series all right we're, we're gonna go out on a on a victory lap zach how do i how do i feel about predictions I, you don't like making them. I don't like making them. I think there's no point to them. And I think people should not spike the football when they get them correct. Because in this job, you make a lot of predictions and you sometimes are correct. And then that's largely happenstance. Uh, and if you're not going to talk about every time you were wrong, you shouldn't talk about when you're right. And yet, I do think this is... We like these teams. Th Early. This is a weird enough outcome that we this have is a weird to, enough outcome. We have to take you back to earlier in the season when we had arguments about re really two teams. Th we had arguments about two teams that we loved and the other one didn't love. You loved the Rangers. Yeah. I think I said flatly that they're bad. Yes, Very they're wrong. not. I loved the Diamondbacks. You didn't push back as firmly as I was I just did, like, I don't know why. I don't know what's yeah. good about them. <laughs> didn't get <laughs> it. Uh, and... We were we were right. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. So even though the whole premise of this podcast is it's totally okay to jump on the bandwagon at the last possible minute and just enjoy the ride into the World Series, for once, we're going to be like, don't bandwagon them now. Bandwagon them several months ago like we're, we're we just, did. Yeah, we're driving the bandwagon. We're driving the teams. bandwagon. Exactly. Um, so yeah, we're going we're gonna to go out on a little clip. And then after the clip, it's going to be the outro. But in case you don't listen to that, you should subscribe to this podcast and you should read what we write and we'll do another podcast soon. Zach, I was going to say who amazed you this week, but actually they've been amazing you for a long time because the little the little conceit, the unnecessary attempt to tie these two together that we're doing this week is teams that you and I both predicted were going to be good. And now they are. Wow. You hey, uh, good? you could say that I'm not amazed at all, but uh, I actually am a little bit amazed that the Arizona Diamondbacks are tied with the Dodgers atop the NL West. 
Uh, they did briefly have a tie for the best record in the National League in general. They they lost that one to the Braves in a series this weekend, but they are a very good team. Uh, and it's mostly because of a collection of young players all kind of bubbling up together. Uh, they also made what looks right now to be a very savvy trade this offseason, sending Dalton Varsho to the Toronto Blue Jays for... Gabriel Moreno, who's been great as a defensive catcher and and hitter, uh, pretty good as a hitter, great as a defensive catcher, and also Lourdes Gurriel Jr., who's having his best season in the majors by like a mile, and uh, combine that with you know Corbin Carroll, who everyone thought was going to be amazing, being amazing, Zach Gallen, who you wrote about at Yahoo Sports, continuing to be an ace, he's probably the Cy Young favorite in the NL right now, and uh, yeah, that this is the type of team that you don't necessarily see coming because it's. Uh, just you need a bunch of young guys to progress together at once. And uh, in the Diamondbacks case, they are. And I'm going to take the victory lap now so that if they do fall out of the playoff race, I don't have to think about it. I don't believe in taking victory laps for preseason predictions because it's like it falls into that. There's like a like a a scientific theory about how like. If you predict enough unlikely things, it becomes likely that one of them is going to happen. Um, I only predicted one unlikely thing, though. And this what was, was it? it. That's you didn't predict anything else. Well, I predicted the Astros wouldn't make the playoffs, so that's we'll see right. how that plays out. Um, if that if that happens, I'll uh, you can take a victory lap. And I don't, I don't actually, I don't remember why I predicted this other than to be contrary to what you thought. You did not think <laughs> that the Rangers were good, and so I was like, I the Rangers not. are good. Um, and then actually, you are the one who ended up writing about the fact that the Rangers are quite good, and you wrote about the fact that the Rangers are quite good because, not just because of the pitching, they spent all this money this past offseason on the pitching. Most notably, they got Jacob deGrom, but he's not even pitching. They got other guys who have been pitching well. Uh, and some of the pitchers they already had, like Martin Perez. Um, But mostly, what you wrote about was the fact that the offense has been incredible. Their little like roster resource rankings, they're first in average, first in on-base percentage, first in run scored. But a more interesting way to say that is that they have the best run differential at this point in the season since the 1939 Yankees. They've scored at least 10 runs 16 times so far this season. I did not see that coming, and neither did their general manager. I was just listening to the athletic <laughs> podcast that had Chris Young on it. And he said, quote, the offensive production so far, I don't think anybody could have predicted. So I feel okay about the fact that I didn't predict that. And if anybody did predict that out there, you actually should take a victory lap because I just thought, I just was basing this on like, this is a team that spent a lot on free agency on the offensive side, last offseason and then this offseason they spent on pitching and that just the combo of those things seems like uh they're investing a lot they it's interesting because there's been so much attention paid this season to teams that concentrated like all of their free agent spending this past year and then that's not panning out whereas the rangers it is we should look more at what the rangers are doing also, they're hitting 336 with runners in scoring position, which is probably not going to hold up. But things that don't hold up that are really cool in the moment are some of my favorite things because people love to be like, that's not real. It's not going to hold up. And it's like, well, those are separate things. It can still be real even if it's not going to hold up. And a team that's really good with runners in scoring position, I'm not like a particular fan of the Texas Rangers, but I'm very happy for all the fans of the Texas Rangers because a team that's really good with runners in scoring position sounds like a very satisfying team to watch play. You're like, wow, this feels like a big moment. And then they do a big thing. So that's cool. Okay. If you're still listening, that's all we've got for you this week. Zach has been writing about the NLCS. I have been writing about the ALCS. So if you didn't pay attention to one or both, you can read every game. You can you can relive them all uh, at yahoosports.com. Or you can just start reading us now. We're both going to be at the World Series. So we'll have a lot of content from there. And you can follow us on Twitter or whatever or Instagram. Um, thanks to producer John for playing that clip, for finding that clip. Uh, for making the episode look and sound great. And we'll be back soon with another episode of The Bandwagon. 